Welcome to Insights into Entertainment, a podcast series taking a deeper look into entertainment and media. Your hosts, Joseph and Michelle Whalen, a husband and wife team of pop culture fanatics, are exploring all things from music and movies to television and fandom. Welcome to Insights into Entertainment. This is Episode 5, Disney Domination. <laughs> I'm your host, Joseph Whalen, and my lovely co-host, Michelle Whalen. Hello, everyone. And we're going to be diving into things such as Disney's release of their Aladdin trailer. We'll talk about how Captain Marvel is doing at the box office. And Disney released some additional information on their new Star Wars expansion at their parks called Galaxy's Edge. Then we will conclude with Disney's takeover of Fox, which is going to be effective March 20th. So, lots of great things to talk about. Let's get into it. So, Disney released the first uh, Aladdin trailer. The new Aladdin is going to be a live-action version of what is the classic animated movie, directed by Guy Ritchie. Uh, what would you think of the trailer? I really liked it, actually. I, I wasn't quite sure how he was going to feel about it. I'm a classic Disney, Disney girl. Um, you know, I don't like when you mess with you know, the originals, and Aladdin happened to be you know, one of the... The movies that I was very into when it came out, the music, the story. I was in high school at the time. Um, was I in high school? No, I think I was, yeah, I think it was high school. Um, so very into it, and so it's kind of like, oh, why are you messing with it? But after seeing it, I liked how they paid, you know, homage to the original, but then also kind of had their own twist. Um to it as as well. I don't think you could ever replace Robin Williams as the genie. I think that's definitely hard, you know, shoes to to fill. But from what you know, we saw in the trailer, Will Smith definitely is is doing a a, a good job, in my opinion. So, and and I would tend to agree that I think the toughest role you had to fill there was genie, and and not because. Will Smith is not capable of doing right. it, but because Robin Williams was such a beloved character as Absolute, the genie. Absolutely, and and he made it so much more than what, you know, what it was. Yeah. You know, he put his spin on it, and there was so much ad-lib to it, and, you know, it really, it, it was a reflection of, of him, really. So to have somebody else do that, you know, it, it, it's, gonna it's gonna be hard to to you know compete with um obviously they're bringing back some if not <laughs> many of the uh original songs from yes. the original soundtrack a mm -hmm. uh, whole new world which was the first disney song ever to win a grammy for song of the year uh which also won an oscar uh, that actually makes an appearance in the trailer itself so we know that's going to be part of the uh, movie which is i think uplifting for fans of the original oh, movie. Oh, absolutely. And and when we watched the, you know, the trailer together, I I got goosebumps hearing it. It's yeah. it's always been one of my favorite songs in general to sing and hearing it and and seeing it. Also seeing um, you know, the dance sequences and the Much traditional, more traditional, yeah. You yeah. know, Indian uh dance style was very interesting to see. So it looks like it's, you know, definitely going more ethnic yeah I guess, you know and, and and in a good way so now now obviously it's a teaser trailer so mm -hmm. they they didn't reveal a lot to it everyone right. knows the plot they know the story you know you got introduced to some of the characters that mm -hmm. you know obviously the one big character genie here we saw will smith uh in a couple of different scenes in the in the trailer mm -hmm. so He's not in blue in the whole movie. Right, right. Um, he seems to have a much more laid back, relaxed kind of feel mm -hmm. to it. Right. Jafar. Mm. So we didn't see a <laughs> lot of Jafar, okay? Yeah. It, it, I didn't see Jafar in Jafar. He just didn't right. seem evil enough he, for me. Yeah, he didn't, in, unless that, unless the scenes that we saw him in were meant to be. 
I don't want to say the kindler, gentler Jafar, but the, hey, I'm not a menace to society, right. evilness Jafar, and that at some point he and, snaps, maybe? And, you know, playing devil's advocate, Jafar does have a duality to the character itself mm-hmm. where he's not supposed to look evil all the time. Right. And I think the scenes that we saw him in, it was before he got his power and he was supposed to be evil and stuff, so... Maybe, maybe I'm that's... I'm holding out hope that right. he gets a lot more evil, because Jafar is one of the great Disney villains of all time. Right, absolutely. And and that's the thing, is I think in the cartoon, he always looked evil to begin with. Right. He had that menacing look about him, and then, of course, when he got, you know, the evil power, it, it overtook him even more, so... You know, hopefully, maybe that's what they were going for. Is like, oh, look, Jafar's not that bad. He can help us control everything and, and you know, not be mean. So right. maybe, maybe that's what they're doing. Uh, one thing that I think was very tasteful in the, its tribute to uh, the original movie is they brought Frank Welker back to play the voice of Abu. That's really cute. Which I think is, is, is touching, I think, to a lot of people, the fans of the original movie well and not to you know to to jump the boat with the it's not on our our list of things to talk about but the lion king right live action that's coming out how james earl jones because you, you can't not you have can't, james exactly earl jones. you can't have mufasa be somebody else but like you can't have darth vader without a- it being james earl jones because it's such a distinctive voice right so it's kind of cute where could you have done somebody else a- as a boo Probably, I don't yeah. think you'd you'd notice it with somebody else, but that's a nice little touch. But like, that's the thing; that's right. that's the homage that they pay Absolutely. to the original film. Absolutely, so kudos to Disney for that. Hey, Disney. So, Captain Marvel has been released. We actually haven't seen it yet. We're going to see it today. Yes, we see it in a few hours. Very excited to see it. I've heard nothing but good news about it. Killing it at the box office. Had a $61.3 million opening its first Friday. Uh, $153 million its opening weekend domestically. Uh, second only to Black Panther at $202 million. Not bad. No, that's 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 some serious money to, to talk about there. Mm-hmm. Uh, overseas, $302 million overseas. Wow. Which includes $89 million in China. The fifth highest international opening weekend ever. So this thing's all over the the books here. And you figure it's not a holiday weekend because that's always... Correct, yeah. uh, You know, a big thing. Oh, if it's over the holiday, then you get this and this. So just the fact that, you know, it did that well on non-holiday, that's impressive. Uh, So it's even done 36 million in IMAX theaters among the top five debuts of all time in IMAX theaters. Wow. Um, so people want to see this in all formats. One interesting stat that came out was big draw of this movie is the, f- the fact that it's a you know first female lead in a in a Marvel movie. Fifty five percent of moviegoers were male. Just goes to show you it doesn't matter who you stick on the screen there. Right. The the fact that you've got fifty five percent of your viewers being male mm-hmm. tells me that we're breaking barriers, mm-hmm. and that's a that's a good thing. Well, and I think too is that. Marvel on a whole is just doing such an exceptional job with all of their their movies in the the franchise and of course you're getting ready for Endgame. Right. You know, which right. is not that far away now. So, you know, here's another movie you need to watch to, you know, make it to Endgame and understand that. So, I think you also have people that are fans of you're in, they're invested already. Absolutely, in, in you the know, just like story. when another Star Wars movie comes out, all Star Wars fans are going to see it. So right. everybody that's a Marvel fan and is waiting for you know Endgame to come out, well, okay, I got to get something in. But obviously, with the numbers, people are are you know are enjoying it as well. What I what I thought was interesting was seventy four seventy four percent of the moviegoers were over the age of twenty five. Clearly, superheroes aren't just a kid thing anymore. Oh, and and I think they've kind of realized that for a while now because all the people that are going to the movies are the the people that read the comics. You have you know you have all of those people, and then 
you know, other people, you know, like myself that didn't read the comics, but remember the Superman movies and, you know, the original Batman movies and things like that, you know, stuff that we watched when we were, were kids and now we're taking our own kids to it and our own kids are fans of it, you yeah. know, as well. Yeah, it's a great family tradition. Absolutely. One last stat that I have to throw out there, which I just saw on Friday, is that Captain Marvel is currently the highest grossing movie ever with a female lead. Girl power! That's pretty impressive. That is impressive. Especially considering the reception that Wonder Woman wound up getting when it yeah, came out. Yeah, yeah. Great movie, um, or great reviews of the movie, I should mm-hmm. say. And hopefully, you know... We walk out of here, and it's a it's a great movie when we go to see it today. Um, and and it's funny. I I just went, you know, made a comment to to our daughter. Hey, you know, you're gonna wear your Captain Marvel shirt today. Well, I thought I was wearing it when we went to the movies. Well, we're seeing it today. We are. You know, <laughs> she was excited. So that's too much. You know, prodding. You know, from her, she's excited to see it. So, yeah. you know, that makes I'm me sure, proud. I'm sure we'll have uh, a brief review or at least mention in next week's podcast of what we think. I'm sure we will. In other Disney news, Disney announced the opening dates for Galaxy's Edge, the new Star Wars Land expansion to what, what? Disney World <laughs> and Disneyland. What I think is really funny is like I had so many people at work come up to me because I am like the Disney aficionado at work. Everybody knows, every you know, on Facebook, everybody tags me with Disney news and things like that. So I had at least five people come up to me when they made the announcement that Galaxy's Edge was, hey, did you hear? Did you hear? Did you hear? I'm like, yeah, I'm, st- I'm still not going to it right, right now. Right. <laughs> I'm, I'm not crazy enough to go. But hey, if you want to go, more power to you. <laughs> So we have two expansions, uh, one in Disneyland that will open May 31st and one in Disney World that is slated to open on August 29th. Uh, now, not all rides are going to be open when a new expansion mm-hmm. opens. So they're doing a two-phased approach. Uh, phase one, we'll see the Millennium Falcon Smugglers run, most of the shops and restaurants, and then phase two gets you Rise of the Resistance ride. And uh, that will be later this year, Disney says. And that's and that's typically what they've actually done for most of their new expansions is it's usually done in phases. So I don't know if they already knew they were going to do that and kind of left it, you know, as a surprise to make it seem like, oh, look, we made it, you know, we're opening up earlier than before because they did that with Toy Story Land. Um, they did that with New Fantasyland. You know, nothing's ever ready right. all at, at one well, shot. And, so. and Disney's always under a constant state of construction, too. Mm-hmm. So Abs- Yeah, they always are. Mm-hmm. And in, in constant competition with, with Universal these days. So, right. you know, so, so I'm sure part of it was, you know what, let's not wait. How much can we get done? How much can we open up right. and, and start getting the people in? So one of the things that did make news with this announcement was that initially to avoid overcrowding, guests will need to obtain a reservation to visit the new area. Now, this was only for Disneyland from what I've seen so far. Okay. They went into a little bit more detail, and they basically said you'll need reservations from the time of launch until June 23rd, but if you are... If you're staying at one of the Disneyland resorts, resort hotels uh, at Disneyland, you'll automatically receive a reservation, uh, but the reservations will be at no extra charge. So to me, it almost strikes me as like a timed entrance type thing for a museum type thing. Which honestly, I think makes the most sense because you know that's where everybody's going to want to go. That, you know, that's the whole reason why people are going at that time of year that's what they they really want to see and seeing how crowded certain areas get you you need to do some sort of crowd control you know and I so absolutely agree. and and I hope that Disney World does something you know similar cuz that's just going to be a, a manhouse you're going to end up having the park probably have to close 
for capacity issues yeah. because you're going to have so many people trying to get in. So if you do something like that, that would definitely, you know, help. Uh, and they're and they're know, almost identical, the almost identical in size. So it's not even like right. you could say, all right, well, this one's big. Disney World has more capacity. No, they're going to have the same capacity in that area. Right, right. So you're not going to be able to, to to buy much there. Right. Um, but it looks certainly looks promising. Um, the the one thing that I think the reason that they're doing this controlled entrance is that it's the first time in a Disneyland park or a Disney park where it's an immersive experience. Mm-hmm. You're not you're not a guest coming into a section of the park. You're supposed to be part of the story itself. And I think if you get a mass population coming in as you being part of the story itself as you know playing a character in this role, almost like going to a, a renaissance fair. Right, right. Where you're treated like someone who is in the universe rather than treated as a guest. Right, and I think they've been trying to kind of work their way up to that because, like, Toy Story Land is kind of makes you feel like you're a toy in Andy's Land. Like, everything is oversized. From a set standpoint, yeah, but this is... Right. From everything they've said, this is the ca- the cast right. members the, are going to be interacting with you, to, right? And but that's what I'm saying is that they've been kind of leading you to that immersive experience sure. in different stages um, in in Disney uh, Disneyland with Cars Land. It's kind of again the cast members aren't being immersive with you, but from the set perspective, you feel like you are in Radiator Springs. Like sure. there's nothing around. That doesn't make you feel like that. Everything is sized proportion to that and, and whatnot. Toy Story Land, you know, the the toys are bigger than life, you know, bigger than you are. So you feel like you're in Andy's backyard. It's, it's done to make it feel like, you know, like that as opposed to, you know, Tomorrowland where it just looks like futuristic stuff. Right. So I think this is the next level. And they level. did that with the Bugs Life Right. Uh, experience. Right. Bugs so, too, right. So. so I think this is now on a much grander scale. And like you said, the cast members are going to be interacting with you like you are on the planet, you know, visiting from where, you know, right. wherever right. Uh, else within the, the universe. So, um, and there is a story behind it. They, mm-hmm. they're Disney will be releasing several novels to mm-hmm. support the location there will be a, an overriding story that plays out throughout mm-hmm. the whole thing that has a theme to it. So it sounds interesting. And then when you, you go that extra length, you talk about Disney World, where eventually we're going to get a, a themed hotel for it as right. well that will, again, keep you inside that universe. immersive experience, yeah. So that looks, looks very cool. So Disney is taking over Fox, or at least most of Fox, uh, and that takeover is slated to go into effect March 20th after it's gotten, you know, various approval from the government. It was a $71 billion deal uh, in which they bought most of 20th Century Fox. Um, So at the end of this deal, Disney will be getting 20th Century Fox Studios, a controlling stake in Hulu, and a suite of channels including FX, National Geographic, and others. Not so bad. No, no. I think they're going to come out, well, I mean, Disney doesn't really need to come out more powerful (laughs) than it already is. You know my thoughts on Disney as it is. Gee, Um, really? (laughs) There are some remaining elements of 21st Century Fox that will get spun off into a new company called Fox. That includes Fox Broadcasting, uh, Fake News, I mean Fox News, (laughs) and Fox Sports. You really feel, um, <laughs> please, please, hon. <laughs> so, you know, I, I, I'm not a big fan of Fox News. Really, I'm not a big fan of Disney. I would not have shed a tear if Disney had absorbed Fox News and just dissolved it. That would honestly, that would have made probably so many people really happy and so many people really upset. So. Well, you, you, I could guarantee you would have seen the government blocking it at that point in time for reasons we won't get into in right, this podcast. Right, right. That's for a different podcast. Um, so the deal was originally proposed in 2017, at which time Comcast tried to counter the offer, but Disney, having more money than God, came back <laughs> and offered 
a higher offer in July. Right. So the the basic sketch of the combined companies was laid out by Disney executives. Final steps need to happen. Uh, there's some uncertainty on cutbacks, um, which are considered inevitable. Right. Uh, some analysts think that Disney will be laying off at least 5,000 employees from both sides of the merger. Wow. And they've been told to expect at least $2 billion, uh, Investors have been told to expect at least $2 billion in cost synergies by 2021 realized from the operating efficiencies of the merger. Uh, of course, the White House, unable to not comment on things <laughs> because, you know. That's what they do. That's what they do. Um, came out and said uh, this was um, uh, Minister of Propaganda uh, <laughs> Sarah Sanders um, saying, I know that the president spoke to Robert uh, Rupert Mur- Murdoch earlier today and congratulated him on the deal and thinks, to use one of the president's favorite words, this could be great a great thing for jobs. Yes, any time that you're laying off 5,000 people, people, it's a great thing <laughs> for jobs. That's awesome, because you just made a crap load of money. <laughs> um, yeah. Hmm. Uh, he looks forward to seeing a lot more of those created. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. <laughs> so this is, this is huge. I mean, this is a big part of consolidation in the entertainment industry here. Mm-hmm. Yeah. One thing this will net Disney... Uh, I believe, is the first three Star Wars movies which they did not acquire in the Lucas acquisition. Oh, okay. See, I didn't realize they didn't get those. Yeah, so they will have those rights, and and they can put the 20th Century Fox fanfare back into Star Wars movies, which we all miss. Which will make you very happy. That's a tradition that we all miss. So I wonder if they'll do that for the ninth movie. I don't know. It would be interesting. They certainly would be able to. Yeah. What are your thoughts on this as a Disney fan First of all, and as a Disney stockholder, second, are you okay with? Well, let me ask you from a stockholder standpoint: Are you okay with Disney spending seventy-one billion dollars to buy Fox? I, mean, I, I I guess so. I'm um you know I I have my shares of stock, and honestly, I've gotten decent dividends the end of the year from them, so I really can't complain. They're you know, looking at my portfolio, you know, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not that big of a stockholder where, you know, I'm going to be able to retire with the money that, you know, Disney is bringing in for me. And it's kind of So like as long as they keep trickling a few <laughs> pennies back to you in dividends, you're happy. I'm, I'm not going to complain. I'm, I'm okay with that. And, and I kind of think that's, that's sort of the mentality Disney's going now. Is we throw a little bit of change back at the people and then we go out and we take over the rest of the world. Sure. It's a much happier place that way. Um, I am kind of surprised that they got through all the regulatory stuff as quickly as they did. Yeah, I am too, especially with how, you know, they, they don't want these big monopolies. You know, there's always somebody, oh, trying to, to break this monopoly apart and this one and that one. You know, I guess there's still so many other monopolies out there that it's not, you know, they're not seen as a threat, I right. guess. I don't know. Well, what do you think this is going to do to Hulu, considering that Disney is about to come out with their own streaming service? Do you think it's going to impact Hulu? I don't know, because Hulu does, you know, where Disney has is planning their streaming service, and it's going to be mostly movies, and, you know, I don't even know if it's going to be any television, you, you know, any... Uh, uh, shows or how many shows they're planning on doing where Hulu, the biggest thing I think that Hulu has its niche is not only their original content, which isn't as much as say Netflix. It's kind of, you know, Hey, we have a couple of things, you know, that are on Hulu. Hulu's I big draw, I think is for people that have cut the cord and don't have broadcast TV. And Hulu is that option to be able to watch stuff on regular broadcast, or at least when I think of Hulu, that's what I've right. always seen Hulu as. Oh, I've missed a show. Let me go and find it on Hulu. Right. You just can't watch it live on Hulu. Right. Exactly. So, you know. Well, one of the things that I did read, and I actually didn't put it in the show notes here, Disney had talked briefly about their intentions, and, and they were basically keeping their Disney-related properties on the streaming service, as you said. Mm-hmm. They were also going to use Hulu as an opportunity to put more 
or less family-oriented programming out there on Hulu. Oh, okay. So Disney streaming was going to be the family. Right. Hulu was going to be the everything else. So I could see the stuff that, that that's no longer on Netflix. Some of the Marvel stuff like Daredevil and Punisher. Okay. Some of that stuff I could see moving over to Hulu. Where they because it's that's not exactly family friendly programming. Right, right. Like the Nick Cage, uh, Nick Cage, Luke Cage, Luke Cage and yeah. you know the the yeah, more Nick Cage doesn't have his own show yet. No, not yet. <laughs> if he does, it would he would just come across as the same he is in every one of his movies. <laughs> Thanks. But yeah, so so that should be interesting to see where they go with that. Mm-hmm. So finally, we're going to wrap up as we do with our insightful picks of the week. And as I always do, I yield to you, my dear. You can go first. Oh, aren't you sweet. So my insightful pick for this week is, again, another Netflix show. Do you think I have a... (laughs) I think you watch a little too much Netflix. I think I do. I think I do at times. Uh, I tend to like those darker uh, types of shows. Um, so we haven't noticed. No, no, not at all. This week's pick is Santa Clarita's Diet. Um, so it's about a husband and wife who are realtors uh, living a quiet life in suburban California. And their world is unexpectedly changes when, changes when the wife, Sheila, goes through a dramatic transformation that sends her down a road of death and destruction, but leaves her looking and feeling better than ever. It's one of those dark comedies where, you know, it's like, hey, I'm eating the next door neighbor, but it's totally okay because he was a jerk and, (laughs) uh, you know, kind of funny. They have, you know, some interesting guest stars. Hopefully our neighbors don't listen to this podcast. (laughs) Right, exactly. Um, No, it's just one of those little quirky things and, you know, dealing with how, um, you know, Joel, the husband, how he's dealing with his wife who's you know, undead now and finding out that she's not the only one out there. Other people are are like her and, you know, trying to, to balance everything. Um, and then the daughter has a friend who he's helping out. So it, 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 it's just kind of funny and quirky, which is, you know, usually what I like. And the new season, uh, starts up, you know, in a couple of weeks. So I'm looking forward to that. So is this a horror or a comedy? It's both. It's both. That's that's interesting. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, very good. So my pick of the week is, uh, again, a little bit off the rails here. Um, we tend to go to a lot of conventions, toy shows, uh, that type of stuff, uh, starting around this time of year and through the summer into the fall. My pick is actually going to be a toy show, our April Fool's uh, toy show uh, down in Delaware at the Nurse Shrine Temple is on Sunday, April 7th. It's $5 to get in. Children under 12 are free. You can visit it at toyshows.org. Uh, they build themselves as the East Coast's largest toy show. Uh, they feature over 175 tables of new collectibles and unique toys. It's a great place for antique toy collectors, nostalgic collections of toys from the 1940s to the present day, if you love your classic 1980s toys, there's a ton of them down there. Uh, you don't have the oppressive crowds that are often associated with some of the more celebrity-laden shows. You're not going to do uh, celebrity signings or anything like that. This is basically people that share the same passion as you if you're a toy collector or an antique toy collector. They're down there. A lot of them really are down there to display their collections. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because some of these collections either aren't for sale or they're asking money that I've you're not going to pay for. seen amounts of money for a little tin train. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, you know, some of these guys display parts of their collections and they sell off other parts and, you know, they're down there buying themselves. So mm-hmm. it's, it's, it's almost a meet and greet of the collector industry down there. Uh, you can browse and shop uh, at a nice pace. Uh, you can talk with the vendors, you can, you can talk about collectibles, uh, the guys are very friendly down there, and, and really, it's people that share the same passion. It's not necessarily a convention experience, this I equate more to a collector's experience, mm-hmm. 
And there's almost always some kind of obscure find or a diamond in the rough down there that I always walk away with. Right. There's know. usually that one thing that, oh, I didn't even know that they made this. Yeah. You know, I never saw this before. You know, is it something where it, it was an import item? Yep. Or uh, we've even found uh, a couple where um, it was like a test model. Yeah, yeah. You know, so it never went into production. So there's, there's usually always that one item that like <gasps> – Wow, that's really cool. Yeah, you know? being being a big Star Wars fan myself, one of the big scores I landed down there was a very reasonably priced, decent condition, carded Darth Vader from the Empire Strikes Back toy line, uh, original. Um, but you know, I also there is a, a someone down there who does uh, custom zombie versions of action figures mm-hmm. and dolls, and I picked up a couple of zombie. Uh, Clone troopers from mm-hmm. Star Wars right, down there right. now. So there's all kinds of stuff that you can find down there. You, there's a movie vendor that's almost always down there. Video um, game vendor. Video I think game vendor. There. If you're into Hess trucks, you've got Hess vendors down there. You've got classic uh, tin type toy vendors down there. There's there. It's huge. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's it's a great experience. They serve refreshments down there, so you can have lunch down there. Uh, and, you know, it's not a full-day event. It's probably about a, a half-day, three-, four-hour event mm-hmm. you could make of it. Yeah, yeah. But it's reasonable to get in. Uh, it's a great environment, family-friendly environment down free there. Free parking. Uh, free parking. You know, it's easy to get to. It's right on DuPont uh, Highway. It's at 198 South DuPont in Newcastle. Uh, it's open from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. on Sunday. And the day before, we don't go down for but the day before, they also do a train show down mm-hmm. there as well. Right. If you're interested in uh, classic model trains. So, toyshows.org. And I think that will do it for the podcast this week. Uh, just a reminder to everyone, you can reach out to us now. You can email us at comments at insightsintothings.com. You can visit us on YouTube at Insights Into Things. You can visit our main webpage at insightsintothings.com. Or you can go directly to our audio podcast at podcast.insightsintoentertainment.com. Any final words, dear? No, I'm just excited to see Captain Marvel today. Let's get out the door (laughs) and go see it. Thanks so much, guys, and we'll talk to you next week. 